Hello, I'm Barbara Bravelli Moon. I'm the author and publisher of the I Saw It series of field guides for children and families. I did a Zoom meeting with many of you yesterday. I thoroughly enjoyed seeing you and thank you for coming. I did fail to record that though, so I'm going to just redo a little bit of, of what we talked about. Most of what we went over was a preview of the books, the six books that are available to you. Um, and that is on my YouTube video, so you can see that preview there. What I'd like to do here, though, is just talk to you a little bit about the materials that my team and I are putting together now. They're teaching suggestions for using the books um, with curriculum. And these books are not a curriculum, and we're not putting together a curriculum. What we're doing is coming up with ideas of how to implement some of the standards of Alaska, the Alaska um, standards for education um, through, through using the books, but it's not a specific curriculum. If you don't use the standards, that's fine. These are just ideas of how you might implement different um, topics that you're teaching. Let me go here to the desktop with using these field guides. We're putting together materials <clears throat> for language arts in reading, uh, questioning strategies, language, writing, literary devices, and then research. I'll go over just a few of these to show you what we're doing. One of the standards, of course, is in reading is ideas and details. And it says to use information from the text to explain key ideas and to support inferences drawn from the text. So we're giving examples. For example, in the land mammal book on page 18, Dottie Deer, we can make an inference that Dottie makes sure she and her newborn fawns are hidden from predators. That's an inference that you can teach, you can have your children make about that story. The details and examples that support this in inference are it's safer in the forest, it provides more to protection than the open meadow, the fawn's reddish brown fur helps them blend into the trees and undergrowth. White spots on their backs look like bright spots of light that sparkle, speckle the forest floor. And even going out on the beach might mean big trouble. So these details and examples are facts that are actually in the story that was written about Dottie and her, her um, fawns. And you can pull that information from the story. Find main idea of a text and give details supported. Again, there's Woodley Woodpecker talking about um, it very, Woodley Woodpecker is very protective of his territory and supporting details that you would find in the story with your children are right here. Um, further down, paraphrase, summarize key ideas. We took one out of the Waterbird book with Tilma Turn. The key idea is that turns travel great distances. And then a summary statement was written up to talk about how far they actually do travel. Cause and effect, um, craft and structure is, is out of the standards, but it isn't something that we normally use in language. But this talks about determining the meaning of words or phrases in a text by other information about the, around the words, examples of sequence, comparison, problems, and solution in text. Basically what we're doing is going through looking at standards and seeing how can you teach to those standards if you use them or just as basic teaching ideas using these field guides, integration of knowledge. This is what we're doing in the reading section. Uh, well, I was a teacher for over 40 years. I have my master's in curriculum and instruction and, and I often did some different things with my students um, than were, we were asked to do, but I felt like this was really useful for the children. This is one of the things that I loved having the children do to increase their, comp their comprehension when reading expository text, which is something that's key in our educational system now and um, is often quite hard for children to do. A basic fact is that everything in expository text is an answer to a question. And so if we read looking for the question, our minds actually work differently than simply reading for information or looking for answers to someone else's questions. We think differently about what we're reading and we read with more attention when we are questioning. When we look for questions, when looking for questions, write only the question, no answer. Yeah, that's a strange one. 
but it does put our minds in kind of a different focus and a different process when we're looking for those questions. So um, I took two examples. This is from the Waterbird book again, Jethro the Long-Tailed Jaeger, and took a paragraph from that story and then wrote sample questions that could come from that reading. What type of Jaeger is the smallest? Why does Jethro say he is the most unique? Why do we need to look for Jethro on his breeding grounds? What does pelagic mean? So the children working with you or just independently can come up with their own questions. And then from there, it becomes an, uh, just a field, a whole idea of how do we answer these questions or do we even need to? But we get the information and we learn the information in a different way by looking for the questions. There's a second um, example from Eric Elk in the Land Mammal book with a number of sample questions. This will be included in the materials that we're putting together. Language um, conventions of standard English. If you, if you do this with your children and you want them to be learning the, the grammar, basically is what it is. Use pronouns, nouns, pronouns, special pronouns. And what we've done is gone through and pulled out examples from the books and then it's kind of like a close activity with what possibly, with relative pronouns, who, whom, who's, which, and that. Um, what would be a possible relative pronoun to fill into the sentence? I'm not a big one on correct answers. It's possibilities. What might fit in there and make sense? So we have that for the nouns, pronouns, relative pronouns, verbs, adjectives, adverbs, relative adverbs, and then um, more on adjectives, prepositional phrases, sentence fragments, run-ons. Now, these are examples that we're pulling out. What ideally we would love to have people be able to do is have these as examples and samples, and then go ahead with your children and find new ones. Where else could we find a paragraph? There aren't run-on sentences in the text, and there are not fragments, we hope. We've done careful editing. But to go through and and turn some of the paragraphs into um, having run-on sentences. How do you how do you make a run-on sentence? How do you not have one? So this will translate into work then when they're doing their own writing. Frequently confused words. The sets of words below are often misused. See if you can find the right word to put in each space or one that would work. Two, two, and two, there, 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 than, than, here, here. So we're working on getting practices for the children to use and then to move on from that. In writing, um, all kinds of ideas for writing from these books. In fact, I had a, a mother call me or email me one time telling me that she couldn't get her son to write. He just wouldn't write. But he was a little hunter. He loved to go to hunting with his dad. And so he would come back from experiences out in the, out in the forest with his dad and get his books out. And if he had seen a porcupine, then he'd write about seeing the porcupine. Or if they had seen caribou, he'd write about seeing the caribou. So hopefully this will increase your children's writing interest if they're interested in any kind of animals. Um, we've come up with some ideas, um, but it's just unlimited to take these and, and just run with them and play with them. Um, one is write your own marine mammal story to choose a favorite marine mammal that's not included in one of the field guides, design 10 questions, and then do the research. We're also putting together see a way to research, record, and present information. We'll be putting a piece together on that. Logical order for the questions and information, and then write, I always called it sloppy copies instead of rough drafts. Sloppy copy, the children understand what that is. Um, my facts is needed, peer editing. One of the greatest things I think we can do to help children write is, is avoid our correcting as much as possible and have them work with either a sibling or another child that's around the same age and let them have conversation about their writing and read it aloud and, and rework it with, other, with another child. Um, an action story. This one would be great fun to take two animals of any kind that have a confrontation or a conflict do personalities and behaviors clash? Are they in competition for habitat, for food? Is one food for the other? Come up with a plot outline for their story. So to choose two different animals and then um, what's the conflict that they have? And 
just write their own story about that that conflict and that that whole scenario. They'd come up with the literary literary elements of exposition, the inciting incident, rising action, climax, falling action, and resolution. It could be so much fun for the children to come up with those, develop facts and believability for each element, write their sloppy copies. And then as they develop it to use illustrations for their own story and then complete their story and their drawings. And I always had a, an author's chair in my classroom where the children could sit. It was a, like a, a captain's chair and they'd sit up there. We decorated it with lights and all kinds of things. And we would have author day. And the children would all be able to read their stories sitting up in, the, in their author chair. And another thing that we did was something like this. We would do skits, have the children do their own backdrops and all kinds of things to, to bring their animals and their stories alive. Meet the Mammals could be a talk show interviews where they pair up and work or work with each other. Um, they mimic a talk show with one child taking the part of the host and the others the guest. The parts would rotate and then they would ask questions and see who could come up with answers for them. And costumes and props could be used with that. Name Your Mammal is a game uh, kind of thing where they come up with questions. What's they put an animal on your back. I think you've seen this done probably. And, and by asking different questions, the children try to guess who their animal is. Poetry, of course, would be unlimited things we could do with poetry out of the books. Analogies. Um, so these are examples, and we're just getting some of these started, and I'm excited. I wish I had a group of children to sit down and do some of these with. It'd be so much fun. Literary devices. Um, these are special techniques writers use to bring their writing more alive. They draw attention to important ideas, create interest, etc. Um, we don't, I didn't use a lot of literary devices because these books are so fact-based. They're actually nonfiction, expository, written as stories. So there wasn't a lot of room for a lot of these, but I did use some alliteration. Um, sea snails, shells are super. Do you smell something a little stinky? Shh. Um, these are great fun for the kids to put together. I won't say this right, but anthropomorphism is another um, literary device. And that is when animals um, take on human characteristics. And so all the stories in the books um, use this literary device. There's just one example from the new book, um, the graceful decorator crab. She's quite a fashionista. And so there's quite a bit of um, giving the human traits, of course. Collo colloquialisms, foreshadowing imagery, metaphor, I'm a dangerous eating machine, onomatopoeia. One example we found of personification. I would love it if some of you could find other examples. There's not a lot of that point of view, of course, it's all first person, but there's also some third person repetition with our downy woodpecker similes and tone. Tone is so good to work on with children when they're doing their writing. Um, that's how they bring life into their writing. So these literary devices will be available. And then we're working on the research piece now. Math we based in grade four. And we looked at the, we looked at the uh, standards and then kind of rewrote them and revised them so that they were a little more um, down to earth as far as I'm concerned. Basic addition, multiplication, subtraction, division of whole numbers. And we've gone through and taken examples. For example, with the whales, I'm Warwick, a killer whale who weighs 22,000 pounds. Wilbur Finn whale, whale over there, he's much heavier than I am, weighing in at 140,000 pounds. How much more does old big old Wilbur weigh than I do? So basically just making up story problems using the my facts section. What I would be doing, I think if I had children at home with this, is I'd have them make up problems for each other or for me. I'd love it when the children make up problems for me and using all the multiplication, division, whatever they wanted to use. Fractions, we went into some fraction work. The black cap chickadee, chick, chickadee here, a small little guy who weighs only three tenths of an ounce. Can you change my weight fraction to another equal fraction? I'll help. So Chip gives an example of multiplying both the numerator and denominator by two. 
there's a chart down here where they have an opportunity to do equal fractions and then another one. There's lots of work on fractions and decimals, um, equal than, e more than, equal and less than symbols. So there'll be lots of math opportunities. These are just examples though, and the children can help you, I'm sure, make up lots and lots more science. Norma Neal is one of my close friends. She's my editor. She's also a retired teacher, much, very much into science. And so Norma's putting together some science um, ideas. Of course, the books are based in science and um, but pulling together how do we use the books to, to meet some of these ideas we have in science. So she's pulled this together, make observations of plants and animals to compare the ver diversity of life in different habitats. That's, that would just be an endless pr project, but she's come up with some real good ideas. Construct an argument that some animals for groups that help members survive. Right away comes to mind the coyotes and the wolves, also with the marine mammals, the Pacific white-sided dolphins help each other feed. There's a, I think it's the humpback whales that do the bubble feeding, so that would also be another way. Use a model to represent the relationship between needs of different plants and animals in the places they live. Some good examples here about a northern harry, harrier hawk. I was once called a marsh or field hawk because I love wide open spaces. And it goes on to explain about that. So and in interpreting data, lots of examples of how to interpret data. And um, I think we will also have social studies and um, we're looking at some other options with all of this. So that's what we're putting together. It will be available July 1st. Yesterday, one of the people asked if we would be doing it digitally. And I, at that point I said, no, but you know, that's a wonderful idea. So if you want to go ahead and order it, we can send a digital copy um, after July 1st. So if there's any questions or anything, please email me at oceanotterpublishing at gmail.com. And again, the website is oceanotterpublishing.com. But as I said yesterday, um, I can't give the educator discount on the website. So it's best to email or call me if you don't order through IDEA. So thank you very much, and I hope you have a wonderful day and that you're all staying well. Bye-bye.